Imagine that you're a watch company and you have two watches that you sell. Watch A, priced at $800, and watch B, priced at, say, $1,000. Now imagine that half of your customers are buying watch A and half of your customers are buying watch B. Imagine that you want to increase sales of watch B, because it's the more expensive one, perhaps with better margins. How can you do that? How can you influence your consumers to buy more of the expensive ones? And how can you do that, in particular, without changing the watches, or without changing the pricing of these watches, or without changing, say, the advertising of these watches? How can you influence consumers? Why not introduce a third option, watch C, price at $1,200? Now, that watch will create an anchoring effect. In other words, it will make the option B more attractive because suddenly option B now is in the middle. Customers love products in the middle because they're not the cheapest, they're not the most expensive. It feels safe when we buy something in the middle. So suddenly what you will see is a shift in market share away from watch A to watch B. Now imagine that the problem is the opposite now. You want to get rid of the cheapest watch, watch A. What can you do? Well, you could introduce a third option, but this time, price that really low, say a $500. Again, now watch A is in the middle, and that one will experience more sales. So what we've done is fundamentally, we've influenced consumer choices. We have influenced our customers' choose and their preferences simply by adding a third option. And that's the power of marketing because it taps into the psyche of consumers. A lot of the decisions that we make are automatic. We don't think about them. And the power of marketing is to tap into those. The traditional way of doing market research is through consumer surveys, customer questionnaires and focus groups where you discuss a product or a service with customers and you ask them, you know, would you buy it, do you like it, things like that. The problem, of course, with that way of doing market research is that it's very good to identifying opportunities for incremental innovations, like how to improve a product, for example, or to make it slightly better. But it's not great for radical innovation, to create things that are completely novel, things that customers do not expect and wouldn't think of. For example, many years ago, Henry Ford famously said, if I had asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse or a horse that doesn't sleep. And of course, what he meant is that when you ask customers what they want, sometimes customers don't know what they need. They can tell you what their problems are, they can tell you what they would like to accomplish, and then the job of a marketer is to figure out how to help them. So another way of doing market research, for example, is by observing customers. So for example, ethnographic market research, which basically means watching people. Watch them, see what they're doing, see what they're trying to achieve, and then see what kind of problems your customers have that you can solve. So this is something that might allow you to tap into problems that customers don't realize they have. And sometimes also what it allows you to avoid is the problem that customers will tell you one thing and do the other. Take, for example, the example of uh, Swatch, the watch manufacturer. Many years ago, back in the mid-1980s, they came up with a product that was a watch made of plastic. It was colorful, it was crazy, it, was, uh, uh, it had wild designs, and it was made of a material that usually was not associated with watches made in Switzerland. When they tested the idea on consumers, consumers didn't get it. They didn't understand it. They said, I wouldn't buy that. I don't understand it. I don't like it. Yet they went ahead with it because they thought, no, this, we're doing something that is unique, that is different, because what we're selling is not a watch. People are thinking of it in terms of a watch. What we're selling is a fashion accessory that tells time. Swatch. Swatch. Always different, always new, fashionable. And the moment that this was provided to consumers back in the 80s, suddenly they started to get it, but it was only when they started to experience the product. So sometimes traditional market research is, cannot be trusted. Sometimes you've got to go also with your instinct, especially when you have an insight that is uh, unique, that is powerful, that taps into these kind of problems that you can solve. Market research is, of course, evolving even beyond that. Nowadays, for example, we have a lot of neuromarketing that is growing quite dramatically. Neuromarketing basically involves looking at people's brains, scanning people's brains and see how they respond. Hollywood producers, for example, have started using this technique. They have a TV show. They want to know whether it's going to be a success. Well, they can get consumers, for example, to watch a pilot episode 
of the TV show and then scan their brains to see what areas of the brains are activated. Are they enjoying their show? Is it triggering responses that are positive? So we are almost bypassing now in market research consumers' views and we're looking straight into their heads to look at how they respond to a specific product and service. So a big part of marketing fundamentally is about influencing others, it's about persuasion. So whether it is selling products and services or marketing anything that your company is offering or also in personal relationships. Think about how often in life you have to persuade others, to influence others. So this is where marketing techniques and the marketing toolkit really comes in handy. Think, for example, about the power of storytelling in marketing. Now, think of a brand like, I don't know, Rolex in watches. If you want to know what time it is, fundamentally, you don't need a very expensive watch. You probably have your phone that does that job. Yet people pay a fortune for those watches. Why is that? Because when you buy them, you're buying them into a story, into the heritage, into the tradition, something that emotionalizes the product. So a product is part rationality, for example, for a watch is telling time, or part emotionality, so everything else that differentiates it on an emotional level. Think, for example, about the job market. So you've graduated, you're looking for a job, you need to promote yourself fundamentally against the competition, other people applying for the same job. You need to connect with people both rationally and emotionally. So just as Rolex tells a story, what is your story? What makes you special? What is your point of difference? Try to figure out what is it that might make you different from other people and then build a story around that. Now, why is storytelling so important in marketing? Well, research has shown that we're biologically wired, pre-programmed to respond in a certain way to stories. That's why people love stories, because it triggers this chemical in our brain associated with happiness. So become an amazing storyteller, tell your story, find out what makes you special, and that will make you more effective also in normal everyday life. And then as you progress through your career and you become a leader, Think about how important it is for a leader to influence others, to give them a good reason to follow you. Remember, people have choices. They can either follow you or not. And therefore, it's important to make yourself magnetic, to attract the uh, uh, preference and the liking of people for all the right reasons, in the same way as a brand like Rolex does that in the watch industry. Now, marketing is borrowed extensively from a wide range of disciplines, whether it is economics, sociology, psychology, and so forth. So when you study marketing, you're likely to be exposed to a lot of these different disciplines, different approaches, different angles, different perspectives, which makes marketing quite interesting because it's so diverse. For example, you might study marketing management, which is about how to develop a marketing plan. How do you develop marketing strategies such as promotion, advertising, or uh, product-related decisions, etc. You might study brand management. How do you create, manage, and strengthen a brand over time? How do you connect with customers through uh, very successful uh, brands? How do you create brand equity? So how do you improve the value of your brand? Uh, you could be studying marketing communications, for example, digital channels like social media, influencer marketing, things like that, but also the more traditional channels like such as TV advertising and so forth. You might be studying customer relationship management. How do you build loyalty? How do you connect with customers over time? How do you create enduring value for customers in the long term? Or you might be focusing on things like marketing analytics. How do you measure the impact of marketing performance? Or how do you use data, for example, to predict consumer behavior? And finally, of course, you could study uh, consumer psychology, customer behavior in a lot of detail, like the psychology of customers and what drives their decision making. So these are just some examples of the kind of things that you might be exposed to when studying marketing. Marketing analytics is becoming extremely important. Research shows that market leaders are the ones that are using data very, very well. Yet a lot of companies are still not quite sure how to use the incredible amount of data that is available to companies these days. 
think about all the traces that you leave behind as a consumer on a daily basis. When you walk around with your phone and you have your GPS enabled and someone is tracking where you are and where you're going. When you're using your credit card to buy something. When you go online and you do a search. So think about, for example, when you're talking around uh, an Amazon uh, enabled device with Alexa and they're listening to everything that you say. So the amount of data that is generated from you every day is enormous. And this is very, very precious to companies. So take Tesco, a very large supermarket in the UK and their loyalty program called Club Card. Club Card is a loyalty program that although it's called loyalty program, it's doesn't really have much to do with loyalty. It's not about making consumers more loyal. It's not about making us more likely to go to Tesco uh, relative to another supermarket. What they use their program for is to collect very sophisticated data about consumers. Now, if you become a member and you scan your card every time you visit a Tesco store, at that point, they're collecting very precious data about you, what you like, your preferences, your shopping habits, so what can they do with that data? Well, they can use that data, for example, to improve store layout. They know the kind of products that you buy and at what time of the day you buy them, etc. And so it allows them to fine tune the way in which the products are displayed to you. They can use it to customize their offerings, to uh, target you with promotion that is meaningful to you, to try and promote products that you actually buy. They can even do more sophisticated things with this, with this data. For example, if they can predict what time you're going to be in the store, what kind of products you're going to like and whether it's going to be hot or cold outside, they can, for example, tweak the temperature of their refrigerators. This allows them to reduce food waste. It allows them to manage inventory effectively, but also reduce energy costs dramatically. In the United Kingdom, research has shown that Tesco saves about $20 million or so a year just by doing this, just by using your loyalty data and matching it with other data. So the power of data analytics is extraordinary.